All right, this is Chapter 8, Network Risk Management. Um, this is in the seventh edition of the book. In prior editions, they didn't have this exact chapter this way, so it's, it's new, but it's good. So we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff. Security assessment. Uh, how many of you think you have a secure network at your house? Think we're good? No delusion. We, we hope we're secure. Okay. Do you ever wake up in the middle of the night or in the morning and say, man, I forgot to lock the back door? Happens to me all the time. I have kids. and Network-wise, I mean, the denial of service Friday. You all heard about that? Internet went down? A large part of that was because some hackers got into some cameras and took them over and actually used those to take down part of the internet. So, I mean, you know, the Internet of Things. You all heard of the Internet of Things. I'm actually writing a project for that right now for tomorrow for my other class. But, yeah, so my house now, I have <coughs> Apple TVs, a couple of those, a couple routers. I have Hue lights so I can control those remotely. I have multiple cameras I control, multiple different versions or brands of cameras, thermostats, uh, alarm systems. What else do I have? Just, just all kinds of devices that are connected. And what happens if one of them gets compromised? compromised. Yeah, it could be. It very well could be. So, you know, it's just because you're secure today doesn't mean you're secure tomorrow. And that's what this chapter really goes into. So it says a thorough examination of each aspect of the network to determine. Okay, so in this room we have this switch. A Netgear, whatever the heck version it is. Non-manageable, pretty much just a switch. So what do you think? You think we're safe with that one? I think we're probably safe with it. I don't know of any exploits or any problems with them, but you really need to look at everything. Okay? We got IP phone right there. You know, there's a, you ever heard of software called Cain, C-A-I-N? It's free. You can download it from OXID.IT. Um, we actually use it in a bunch of other classes, but... With Kane, you can automatically record all voice over IP telephone calls straight to an MP4, MP4 file. It's crazy. Printers, I'm telling you, very soon there's going to be issues with printers. Printers have memory. Why couldn't someone break into that printer and store something in that memory and make it do stuff? So, you know it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Because we're securing other areas of the network. We're, we're doing good with our firewall, but, you know, it's this kind of stuff, the printers and the cameras. You know, we all want home cameras, don't we? Yeah. I, uh, I'm going to make a sign from my house. It's going to say, this house has 16 cameras. Nine of them are working. Six of them are recording. Now, which one? <laughs> Break in if you want. Just hope you pick the right camera to do it through. So, okay. But uh, so it should be performed at least annually. Yeah, we're always adding stuff, always changing stuff. Security audits should be done. You know, at your house, you really, eh, not that big a deal, but it wouldn't hurt to perform it at your house. Okay? When I, you know, I, I ran an ISP for years in the consulting business, much longer than that, and whenever I had a client that wanted something, I would do it at my house first. I had a client that wanted an exchange, or first of all, Active Directory, so I had I put, sold the domain in my house until I knew how to do it perfectly, then I sold it. They want an exchange server, did the same. They want cameras, did the same. So I always, that way I could try it out and screw it up on my own stuff and then sell it to them. But auditing, you really need to look around, okay? Hackers, obviously somebody breaking into your network. The problem is now you got a lot of, there's so much stuff you can download and become a hacker. You're not really a hacker, more like a script kitty. You're downloading exploits. You're downloading Metasploit. You're going to use it in another class, but... Metasploit is awesome. You connect to this machine and say, okay, scan will tell you exactly where the vulnerabilities are and connect right through it. Done. It's, it's built to check for vulnerabilities. So what if you use that tool to become a bad guy? You can very easily. So it's crazy stuff. Vulnerability says a weakness of a system. Okay. Tell you what, Ted Ziskindito, that's my weakness. That's just good stuff. Uh, but uh, vulnerabilities and weaknesses and everything. Okay. Exploit. Now we know what their weakness is. Now we're going to export it. Okay. Um, zero day, that's something we just learned about. And you know the, the whole San Bernardino iPhone deal? You know, the FBI paid oh, yeah. million something to some dude. 
he just used the known exploit that hadn't been patched yet by Apple and got right into the phone. It's like, why didn't the FBI just do that? I know, exactly. So, zero day, is, you know, brand new. They haven't fixed it yet. Think about it. I, I think there's actually, I don't I mean, I had the information somewhere, but Apple has this huge list of ways you can make money. Like, if you find an unpatched something in their system to do this, they'll pay you hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, you can make a lot of money looking for, you know, issues and systems, you know. You know, a lot of people say, man, that'd be too hard to do. But if you think about it, okay, Tiger Woods, you all know who Tiger Woods is. He golfed since he was a little kid. So how many years did he put in before he actually got good at it? Imagine if you actually spent that amount of time trying to exploit a computer. You know you're going to get good at it. It's just that we don't spend as much time. So, All right, half of all security breaches, human errors. That, that's a biggie. We all make that problem. We all type the wrong key, forget to lock something, put in the wrong value, or whatever. Okay? Ignorance. A lot of people you probably work with don't have a clue what they're doing. We got a couple here on rows. And yeah, when I first started teaching here, well, I made not my first, but a few years after I started teaching here, I was teaching down in room 200. And I'll be darned, I'd go to teach a 540 class. Six o'clock machine reboots. Right in the middle of my lecture. Multiple days in a row. I'm like, <coughs> what is going on? So I contact IT services. Oh yeah, we're doing updates. Why is six well the campus closes at five, so we're doing them at six. I said classes don't close till nine, so you can't be doing updates on classroom computers. Oh, we didn't even think about that. So I would call that ignorance. I mean, I don't know what it is, but yeah. Omissions. You didn't think about something. Man, I totally forgot about that. Or I forgot to lock the door. Or I didn't even think I needed to do that. Um, way back when the Internet was made, the old ARPANET, they were worried about security. No. They got it to work. Is that when Al Gore did it? Yeah, Al Gore <laughs> did it. Bunch of tubes. Yeah, series of tubes. But basically, you know, when they made the Internet, they did not make it secure. They made it to work. I write software all the time for different things, and it's like, ooh, I got that to work. Did I really think about the security aspects while I was doing it? No, I just want to get it to work. I always tell people, if I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to run a bank. Okay, I'm going to be Ken's bank. So would I be better off picking a 7-Eleven, buy it out, turn that into a bank, or building a bank from scratch? What do you think? So how secure do you think 7-Eleven is going to be? How, how good is that vault going to be? It's probably going to be in the employee bathroom or something. There's no security built into 7-Eleven. The Internet is 7-Eleven. It wasn't built for security. We're trying to secure 7-Eleven. <coughs> IPv6 is the bank built from the ground up. Because now that we know what the issues were, the problem is IPv6 has been out for years. It's not implemented fully yet. It's partially, but not totally. So, Social engineering, it talks about you know, ways to gain a password. Kevin Mitnick, some of you might have heard of Kevin Mitnick. He actually wrote a book called Ghost in the Wires. Really, really excellent book. You need to read it. If you never read it, you need to read it. Uh, my, uh, I guess he's 16 year old now, steps on, oh my God, he started reading that book. He loved it. He thought that was the coolest book in the entire world. We actually had him come here at Rose State in 2013, cost us $24,000 for two hours. But it was good. Who is calling me? No, I don't want to talk to you. Okay. But, um, so social engineering, trying to get you to give them information. I, I do a, a whole talk on that. I usually give it to high school people. But if you act like you know what you're doing, some of you I knew who I was. I just walked in and started teaching. I could be some weird guy off the street. You don't know. Okay. Phishing, gleaning access, authentication, whatever, through email. I was actually at a uh, conference in Tampa, Florida a few years back, and the director of the FBI was speaking. And he says, yep, I'm no longer use, allowed to use online banking. Why? It's like, well, it turns out I fell for a phishing attack in email. And my wife says I'm too stupid to use <laughs> online banking. So he goes, I'm the director and I can fall for it. 
I've gotten viruses before. You know, they're changing. Once they, you know, they, they're always changing. Uh, Jeff Caldwell, the uh, VP of Academic Affairs, next building over, he was over in my office this morning. He was on this hunt to get rid of viruses because he got really infected. We had to re wipe out his machine and get it all rebuilt for him. But now he's like, it's his mission. He's like, I woke up at 3.30 this morning. So I was doing research and I found this thing called R-Kit. And you know, I was like, dude, <laughs> don't, you don't go excessive on this. But uh, you know, fishing's a big deal. You never are totally safe. Now, obviously I have an iPhone, as you can tell with the Apple Watch, but a lot of times I'll open links and everything on my phone. Why do you think I do that, anybody? Why do I open emails and click on links on my phone? I'm not going to get infected. 90% or like 99% of malware is written for Windows to begin with. This iPhone has not been jailbroken. There's zero chance, well, okay, I don't say zero, it's never zero, there's a very, very small chance anything can affect this phone, cause just because of the way it's written. Okay? Just the way the apps are written, the software is written. So if I get a link, say you mail me a link of something, and I click on it, and it doesn't work on my phone, the odds are it's bad. <laughs> so then I'm like, don't click it. I, when I ran my uh, ISP in my consulting business years ago, um, it drove me crazy people get emails and click on stuff. Uh, St. Philip Neary, the Christian school on 15th and just down the street here, just down from McDonald's on 15th. I took care of the network for years and years and years. I knew that. I was good friends with the principal. Betty Novak was her name. She's recently passed away. But she calls me one day. She goes, yeah, Ken, I think I got a virus on my machine. No big deal. No rush. Come on. Come fix it when you can. So when am I going to go over there and fix it? I can't. You know, maybe the next, you know, when I'm Next day, a couple days, I'll be over there. I get over there, and she had WinFixture 2002, I think it was. I was not able to remove it, by the way. It was, it was bringing up random porn images on her machine. The principal of a Catholic school with students in her office on timeout, and her desktop was showing random porn. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> that would have been, Ken, I need you here immediately. Yeah. And I would have stopped everything to get there. But you don't always know what's going to happen. And I don't know what she clicked on. She doesn't know what she clicked on. But I've gotten viruses before. A lot of times I do it just to do it. But, uh, you know, I said so. All right, many risks associated with people. Okay. The 14th of this month, me and my wife would go to the gym every morning. She puts her headphones right on the little pedestal of my monitor in the little case with her name written on it and they've been sitting there every day for years. She uses them to go to the gym and they go right back there. That way you always know where they are. And mine go in my little holder over here. 14th, they were there. Come back on the 17th, they're missing. So I said, yeah, someone stole them, but let's check. Make sure we didn't take them home. Make sure we didn't take them away. So we spent a week, emailed their head guy Monday and said, hey, someone stole my headphones. Sure enough, today, they came over to the dean's office. Yep, yeah, turns out he was right. We got proof they stole them. Because I knew exactly when it was stolen. I mean, happened between Friday and Monday. They only cleaned on Friday night. Wow. So they looked at the cameras, and it turns out they'd already fired the two people last week. So they basically, they said they weren't doing their job. They were really slacking off. But then they looked and said, yeah, sure enough, one of the guys that they fired was the guy who did it. They said, yeah, we have proof you take it. We're going to pay you for it. So. So you don't know. That's someone contract by Rose State stealing from us. Years ago, I used to be in room 131 in my office, and they had a big old like snack bar going. I would buy snacks and drinks and burritos and stuff and sell it to faculty and students at cost. I had a big old refrigerator, big old freezer, all these drawers of food. And every day when I got home, I'd fill them up. And I'd come in the next morning, and they'd be missed. I'm like, did I really forget to fill up the soda last night? And I didn't pay. So if I took a soda out, I didn't pay for it. But I, and basically, I charged what it cost to me. So if I sold $200 worth of stuff and went back to the store and bought the same stuff, it should cost me $200, approximately. I was losing hundreds of dollars, hundreds of dollars a month. It's like, where's this money going? Put a camera in my office. Day one. 
Security guard walks in there, opens the fridge up, grabs him a soda and a candy bar, and leaves. Hour later, walks back in and grabs him a frozen burrito, cooks it in my microwave, and then leaves. Security. That's literally our cops. So I had, a, I mean, awesome picture of the dude. It literally was like hand in refrigerator. I had a perfect shot. Big old poster size of it, put it right on my door, wrote state security is a thief. <laughs> and I told a couple of people about it, and the Monday morning, I, I got the message, Ken, will you please remove the poster? <laughs> Why? I wasn't lying. They said, we know, we know. He's been fired. He's done. He's gone. Please remove it. I'm like, okay. So I removed it. They said, how much do you take? I'm like, I don't have a clue. So I said, 50 bucks, and I'll be happy. Then afterwards, like, yeah. He, always, he never brings food, yet he's always walking around with food. And he always sits in the break room in room 101, eating food all night long watching movies. And no one thought to say, man, where's this guy getting his food from? So the whole people aspect of it, it could be anybody. You don't know. What if you hire somebody? You know, we, got, we, we actually have an opening right now in our network shop. What if I was the bad guy? Fake me some certifications, fake me some experience and a resume, go there and apply, get the job. Break into the network. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen. Okay. The easy way to circumvent network security is take advantage of human and human error. You know what? Change my grade. Yeah, that's an okay triple C. Then we do it over there. You all did see that in the news, didn't you? Yes. 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 Yeah, they do that. We don't do that yet. Yeah, they, they got caught changing grades. Oh, okay. It was what, three months ago, two months ago? First. Yeah, it wasn't too long ago. But um, they were really doing it to help them get grants. So, they but were still. Doing it for Pell Grant people. Yeah, so they were just doing it. I mean, changing grades. And they caught them doing it. And it was actually one of their employees that turned them in. Wow. So, uh, all right, human error. Oh, forgot the lock bar machine today. We have a deal with all of our, net, our lab guys here. That, man, if any one of them leaves our machine open and you're in some trouble, you're <laughs> going to have the, the pink fluffy unicorn background. And you're going <laughs> to, whenever I find a professor that leaves the machines unlocked, I would change the background to Bob does not know how to log off his computer. And that's saved as the background. So next time they log in, Bob does not know how to log off his computer. <laughs> they learn pretty quick. So human error, you know, a lot of things can happen there. Okay. Physical data link network security, there's risks in everything. Okay. I mean, we have a wire here. This wire is not shielded. It's not protected in any way. We could tap into it. Very easy to tap into this wire. Okay. Not quite as easy with fiber optics, but it can still be done. We could jam a signal. Uh, cell phone jammers, y'all heard of those? Those are available. There's network jammers as well. Um, RF emanations, you know, this is created by the leakage of equipment. Everything makes noise. Uh, now it's not such a big deal, but there was something called Tempest years ago. Terminal emulation the military was real big on. Well, uh, what it was is old CRT monitors would give off a signal that could be received up to a mile away. You could actually read what's on the screen a mile away. Scary stuff. Uh, I worked in the network shop at Tinker, my last job out there, and I remember working at the tape library, or fixing some of the tape library, secure area, and all their monitor, excuse me, monitor had all these uh, copper shielding around them to protect it against that kind of stuff. So, right. eavesdropping says never is connected to the internet via public line. We got Cox here. We're connected to Cox. Sooner or later, I'm going to go through one day and all them. Someone could be listening to our traffic, and it does. All, people do it all the time. Okay. When I ran an ISP, I did an update to my router one, my firewall one day, and it was down for a split second, and all my all my servers got hit with a virus instantly. Now I had virus scanners running, but it was the NIMDA virus. If you know anything about that one, it was a virus years ago, because the way ACLs work, you have to remove them and then put them put on the new one. So there's a short period of time where they're down. As soon as I did the remove, boom, all the virus scanners went off. I'm like, holy moly, people were hitting me nonstop. Devin gets between 200 and 300,000 hits per second on their network. People trying to break in at all times, so you never know. Okay. Sniffing, people could listen. Free Wi-Fi. That program came. Super easy to do art poisoning, man in the middle attacks. I can capture all the stuff you're doing. You'll never know. Okay. Uh, port scanners, this is unswitched, you know, 
This switch has an uplink on one of these wires, whichever one it happens to be. We used to have a diagram in here. Uh, actually, it's this. I don't know which one it is. But we could very easily capture on that port and capture all the traffic coming from this room. Pretty easy to do. Okay. Uh, private address. We can talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But your house is probably 192.168-something. That's a private address. Only works inside your house. So that should not be seen on the internet. So if it is, you shouldn't be allowing that. Router attacks, what if a router is not configured correctly? When I first ran my, so I worked it at an ISP, and then I got my own. Because the ISP were not a business, they were idiots. But a friend of mine ran another ISP, so he gave me his configuration. And here's what his configuration was. Block all the bad stuff and let everything else in. That's why he did it. So when I took over mine, obviously I used the same configuration he had because it worked. Does that sound like a good plan? So I'm going to block the bad guys from getting in here, but let everybody else in. It's not a good plan. I should let in the good guys and block everybody else. So shortly after I got mine up and running, I reconfigured mine. I swapped it so it was the other way. Let the good stuff in and block everything else. That's right when the SQL slammer worm hit. SQL was on port 433, and what it was was a virus that hit on SQL servers on that specific port. Brand new virus, first virus on that port. So if he's blocking bad stuff and letting everything else in, that wasn't bad up until that point. So he let it in. He got affected. He called. He was kind of pretty. I'm down. I'm like, Okay, he's like, dude, you're going to be down because I have the same configuration he did. And he's like, no, there's a new virus, told me about the virus. He goes, it's on 1433. I'm like, dude, I'll take care of it when I get home. Not a big deal. He's like, no, you don't understand. You're going to be down. I'm like, no, dude, I reconfigured my whole system. He's like, what? So I told him, I said, yeah, I, I changed it all. Since I wasn't allowing 1433 in, I couldn't get in. So what I did is I changed it. I only let the stuff in that I wanted to get in. I blocked everything else. Okay, so uh, it was funny because after he recovered from that attack, he said, okay, send me what you got now. Because it makes sense. It's what you should be doing. Okay, uh, SS server is not um, secured. What if you got a server that's not secured? You're not looking at it. Um, there's, there's machines all over this world. There was an article in yesterday's news. I mean, I should have kept it. It was about this super really old, it was a Commodore 64 at a auto place that, can, that does something with brakes. I saw that. Yeah. It's, yeah. In like, it's in like Poland. Yeah, it was, it, was here, it was a couple months ago, but it was on again yesterday I saw it. And it was like, this, this place is running on a Commodore 64 with floppy disks. It runs their whole auto shop. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, is that... Network secure? <laughs> no, it's not. And they're probably not connected to the outside world. But if you think about that, the Iranian nuclear reactor, man, that went down a few years ago. Yeah, it, w it was uh, it was Stuxnet virus, which was actually made by the U.S. By the way, that has a air gap, which means that nuclear reactor is not connected to the outside world. Then how'd they get the virus in there? Well, they took a bunch of flash drives with the virus on them, dropped them all over Iran, Iraq. I ran. Dropped them all over, and people picked them up. And someone picked one up and plugged it into the machine inside the, the reactor. That's all it took. Now think about it. Here's an 8-gig flash drive. Not a great one. That's free from real estate. If I left those all over, y'all know you'd be picking one up. And you'd be using it. Now what if there was a virus on there? That's what would happen. But I mean, you think about unsecured, un, I mean, that, that shop in Poland... Commodore 64, we're talking 82, maybe, somewhere around 82. Okay, I don't know. Yeah, you get to the point where you're working at a nuclear <clears throat> reactor and you're still plugging random flash drives into machines. The problem is it could have been anybody. It could have been Janitor. the nighttime guy who was bored and he's sitting, the Target. Target, remember when Target got broken into? It was through the air conditioning contractor system. They had a remote entry port into the air conditioning system that the 
contractor used, and that's how they broke into the target network. So you never know. You never know. There's always something. The cleaning crew. We Actually, years ago, we had a whole bunch of projectors at Rose State get stolen. Tons of them were being stolen. Turns out it was the guy in charge of the cleaning crew actually got the position, totally fake, name fake everything. So he'd bring his people out here, get them all cleaning, and he'd go in the other building where they're not. Since he was in charge, he knew where they weren't. Steal all the projectors and was leaving. So it's, it's crazy. It's just crazy. What was it, last summer? Maybe about three, four summers ago, I attended a class down in Houston, and we used to have a book loan program for my grand students. Books are expensive. I don't know if you all realize that. Well, I had a bookshelf full of books in the summertime. They were all gone. I came back from these three-week training class, and they were all gone. And what we looked on the camera was, there was this guy who the entire night he'd be cleaning with a backpack on. Then you notice, the beginning of the night, the backpack's empty. Then it keeps growing and growing. Finally, by the end of the night, he's got a backpack on that's full. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's crazy. Okay, how about insecure passwords? I bet half of you have got crappy passwords. You're going to learn a whole bunch about that in another class. But you need a good password. There's a website you need to check out. If you've never done this, you can do this at home, whatever. I highly recommend you do this. It's very fast. It's easy to remember, too. It's called, not Rose, how, come on, secure is my password.net. How secure is my password.net. So I'm going to type in the president of Sirius Password from a year ago when he got broken into. You ready? One, two, three, four, five. That was his password. Probably not a good choice. <laughs> Instantly. <laughs> Did you say the president of Syria? President of Syria, yeah. I'm going to type in my current Rose State password, okay? Uh, it's not great. But 38 billion years, <clears throat> you know, we're going to change it in about three months, so I'm probably safe. What's the name of the website? How secure is my password? Dot net. Check my password. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, it, it's awesome. So, if you've never done this, you need to do this. It's, it, it's kind of funny. And I use a program called LastPass as well. If you've ever heard of LastPass, yeah. LastPass.com, go there. I'm not. Please, they got bought out by log me in. But what that does is it manages all my passwords for me, and it generates all random ones. Like all my Facebook and Google and Twitter, and all those are 30 random characters. And they're, they take forever to break. So. How do you, does it plug them in for you? Or what it is, it's a browser add-on that stores them encrypted with AES, and it syncs with their system so you can use it on multiple machines. And you have to know a master password. I use a phrase. I'll, I'll type in my password to get into that system, okay? Oops. That's 118 quadrillion years. So I type in this phrase into my LastPass system, and then it allows me to, I can either copy, review, or even it it'll automatically put in my passwords for me. Actually, works on mobile too. Yeah, and you can even you can go into and copy and paste it and other stuff. Yeah, it, it, it's mainly browser-based stuff, but it can be used. Just I keep my passport information in there and secure notes in there. It's encrypted with AES, so yeah, you know, that's pretty good. That 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 password's good. But yeah, check out LastPass. It's pretty good. I tried to look for an alternative to it, but I can't find a better one. So I'm still with it. They got bought out by Log Me In. I'm okay with Log Me In, except they got everybody hooked on Log Me In Free, Log Me In Hamachi, and now they're charging money. Oh, I realize you've been using it for 82 years and you're loving it. Now we want money. Eh, we're out of there. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah last bath kind of cool. Okay, let's continue on. ARP tables. Wait till he gets done explaining that back to you there. I'm gonna. Okay.
tell you, once you use the last pass, you'll never go back. It's one of those things. It's, it's that handy to use. It'll actually scan your computer. And the scary part is when you install LastPass, it'll scan your computer and input all the passwords it knows it can find. And if it can find them, that means other stuff could have found them as well. Crap, they were actually all there. So, yeah, check out LastPass. But ARP tables. My, what the, I wonder what an ARP table is? ARP, Address <laughs> Resolution Protocol. Because when I'm, yeah, I'm talking to you guys. What, what's your name here? Londell. What is it? Londell. Londell. Okay, I'm talking to Londell. Okay. Now, um, well, that that's, won't be a good example. Darn it. Um, so, okay, my house. I live at 8412. If you watch my videos, I've listed it 8,000 times. But I live at 8412 Tree Line Drive. Is that my address, you think? I mean, that is my address where I get mail. But is that really my address? My physical address. Since you're telling us. Well, it's not. It's actually lot four and five, Deerfield Estates. You know, it's when you buy a house, you actually have the physical location. Because, you know, street names change. House numbers change. So 8412 is the current. It might be that way forever. But on your actual abstract of your mortgage, it actually says this is actually lot four and five from Deerfield Estates and blah, 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 registered on county map 27 and block two and all this weird stuff, okay? So IP addresses, how we communicate, can change as well. ARP translates IP addresses to MAC addresses, okay? MAC address is the physical address of a computer. So if I was to bring up the command prompt here and I type ARP-A, I know it's somewhat hard to see, but you'll see this is all the IP addresses to MAC addresses translated. Okay? They're all translated in there. Let me make this a little bigger. Properties, fonts, make it. Now we'll go to the Lucidia console and go to 20. There, I can see it a little better. Okay? Wow, there's a pile of them in there. So, what this is saying, 10.10.0.2 is the IP address, but the physical address of the machine is 014.22.38.59.af, which is a hexadecimal address. That's the address built into the network card, which can be changed, but won't be. Okay. The IP address can change daily. That's a dynamically assigned IP address. You, you literally could, you know, I don't know if you ever realized that. Look at your phone. You've probably got different IP addresses all the time from wherever you're connecting to. Okay. So ARP tables. I can manually go in there and change it and say, you know, this MAC address is not, no longer on number 25. It's on number 23. So I can change that. It's not hard to do. In that program I mentioned, Kane, Kane can do that for you. It's called ARP Poisoning, and uh, OXID.IT is where you get it from, and right here, and the project is called Kane right there. That's the project you want. Play with that tool. It's darn right amazing. You can break password. You can do all kinds of stuff. You can do wireless sniffing. You can do everything. It's kind of funny because... Um, we had a, uh, an accountant here that worked at, account, at a law, whatever, at accounting, whatever accountants work. But they needed the password to the QuickBooks file because they're, someone quit and they didn't supply the password. So they asked me, Ken, is there any way you can recover this password for me? I said, it's naturally. 150 bucks. They said, not a problem. So what do you, how do you think I did it? Actually, this tool didn't break that one, but I went on Google, typed in QuickBooks, password breaker. Downloaded it, boom, had it in five minutes. So the thing I gave it to him, I waited two days. Because <laughs> if I gave it to him immediately, they'd be like, 150 bucks, five minutes, two days, five minutes, oh yeah, that sounds better. So I waited two days, gave it to him, made 150 bucks. But it came, and it's just amazing with you know, if you want to play with it, be careful because it really can screw up your system. It can, that, that whole art, it really can't screw up your system, okay? But the art poisoning can actually take an entire network down. Okay. 
You could be running this in IHOP. What it does, we'll pretend this projector is our connectivity device. So we're all in IHOP and we're all connecting out through the projector, okay? Well, I could go in there with this tool and say, oh, by the way, I'm, I could tell each one of you, oh, I'm the projector. Or in other words, the router. So what would happen is, so instead of you guys trying to go out through that way, you'd be going out through me. Then I would forward it out. So I become right in the middle of your traffic. So all your traffic is now going in and out of me. And K is nice enough, it'll do that for you, and it'll also undo it for you. Which is nice. It cleans up after itself. But if you don't do it correctly, imagine this. So I break into the network and tell everybody I'm the router. And you all start communicating through me. Okay? Then I just turn my machine off. Then they're all going to be dead. Because <laughs> you're looking for me. Because what I did was I told you guys I'm the router, and I told the router that I'm you guys. So you guys try to talk to the router, you talk to me. When the router tried to talk to you, it talked to me. So I just turned my machine off. Y'all looking for the router, and I'm no longer there. And the router's looking for you, and you're no longer there. So basically, you're all going to be dead for a while. So it can cause a few issues with it. But it, it's kind of a cool tool. But we do play with it in other classes as well. Okay. Man, talk way too much. Okay, risk associated uh, transport session, presentation, application layers. There's so many problems in TCP IP. It just is. There's security flaws. There's problems. And we look at them in so many other areas. Banner grabbing, okay? When I was at the University of Tulsa, um, actually, let me show you this example. We're going to run out of time. I know we are. Sorry, guys. I'm going to type in ftp.ftp.ftp.nei.com. Oops, don't do that. It won't work. There. I just connected to an FTP server at McAfee. Okay. I can log in. I can say anonymous. And uh, there you go. I'm in. I can go in and browse all the files, and I can do whatever I want to do. Okay, easy enough to do. Now, if you look up here where it says 220, SP, FTP, slash 1.0, that is the software they're running. That's the software that their FTP is running. So if I wanted to really break into their system and cause issues, now I know exactly the software and version number they're running. So I can go out and look for an exploit on that specific piece of software. Rather than sitting there, man, I don't have a clue what they're running. Now I know. That's basically what banner grabbing is. Okay? Uh, when I was at University of Tulsa, I was assigned to secure an FTP server. What we did is we built a machine, an FTP server, on, well, at least I did. I was not allowed to secure it. So they could scan it and tell me all the problems with it. Well, one of the problems they told me was, oh, I was running Microsoft FTP server at the time. They said, oh, we can see by your banner you're running IS version, whatever it was, at 6, I think, at the time. Sorry, you can't fix that. Don't ever tell me that. <laughs> like when I was in the Air Force getting ready to retire in 1999, the group commander, yeah, I wasn't, okay, I was overweight, but not terrible, not as much as I am now. He's like, Ken, Air Force Marathon's coming up. You should run it, but I don't think you can. You could never finish it. That's all it took. I actually ran and finished the entire Air Force Marathon. No problem. Well, it took me six hours, but still I finished it. But he said I couldn't. So, but it was in Tulsa. And they told me I couldn't fix that. Well, you can't. There's no fix for it. But if you actually take the DLL, the FTP.DLL that comes with Windows, and open up with a hex editor, and actually find that message, like I did, and change it to, don't you wish you knew? And hit save. And they send it again. They're like, what did you do? I said, yeah, don't you wish I did? Because yeah. now you couldn't tell what it is. What I did was I hid the software that I was running. So now them trying to break in, they're like, great, what software is he running? Now they're going to have to try all the FTP servers out there to try to figure out which one I'm running. It's a kind of a cool thing you can do. There's a lot of stuff you can do in there. But banner graphing, that's an issue. I just showed you how to do it. Okay, session hijacking, that's that whole cane thing I can get in the middle of your communications, and you can even do it a lot worse than that. Um, 
DHCP snooping. I can connect to you wherever your network. Uh, uh, it was popular war driving for a while, where people go around and just connect to other people's Wi-Fi. I was in uh, Arizona with my son. He didn't have internet, and I really needed to do something, whatever it was. I think it was like play Farmville or something. I don't remember. It was really important. So I was driving around. I found a dry cleaner that had an open Wi-Fi. I'm like, oh yeah, I connected that baby and was in there planting something. I think, but uh, so, uh, but DHCP, you can find out. So if I connect to your network at your house, at your work, or wherever, and I get an address, what does that tell me? Well. Let's look what that tells us. So I'm going to type in IP config on my machine here. Not, not like that. Type it here. Ah, hold on. Uh, IP config. <coughs> Just by typing that in, so I got this address automatically. I now know what the IP address is, but I know what the subnet mask is. I know the size of the network. I know what the gateway is. And if I did it with a slash all, Lots more information. I can find out what the DNS servers are. I can actually find out what the DHCP server is that gave me the address. So I can find out all this information just by connecting. So that's what DHCP snooping is. Oh, now I know what your network is. So, okay. Um, dynamic ARP inspection. You can actually review ARP tables and look at them. I mean, just by looking at those ARP tables, you saw all the machines that I was connected to. So now you know a whole pile of them on this network. Okay. All right, at this rate, we're gonna only get 10 slides done. Okay, um, network protocols, network operating systems backdoor. So we got Windows, okay, uh, has been updated. Uh, I think it was about a year ago. Um, I happened, to, it was like September, October time period, and I looked at my Windows machine downstairs. No updates have been applied since January. Wait a minute. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. I mean, there's no update since January. And Jimmy actually was the guy in charge of that at that time, believe it or not, when he worked at IT Services. I'm like, Jimmy. He's like, I know. I'm working on it. I got the update package. We're getting ready to push it out. But I think not, he had just gotten put in that position, so it wasn't really his issue. But, you know, it was too old, too late. Who knows how many flaws or exploits were available on my machine that weren't patched at that point. It's much easier just to not look. You know what? I'm not going to look at that printer over there. I'm not going to worry if it's working or connected or secure. I'm just going to leave it. That's what we all do. Okay. You guys ever check the updates on your routers at home? Some of you. Most of you probably don't. Log into your router. Find out what version it is. Go to the website. Most of you probably have a Linksys. Go to linksys.com. Download the updates. A lot of times they give you new cool features. Some of your routers, like I have an Apple Airport Extreme, that updates automatically. But does it? You know, you might want to go in. I still go in and check for updates to make sure mm -hmm. it does it. Okay. You do that with the uh, Cox routers? Possibly. Uh, see, Cox doesn't normally. They give you access to configure it. Do they? Well, they might. They might not. See, they don't normally. But I'm weary of those. Uh, a story related to that. I t used to take care of a, a, a website and a network for a Nancy Burland Public Relation, Relations. She was a publisher, whatever, for romance authors. Debbie May Comer and a bunch of other, those foo-foo books. Okay. Well, she called me out there to help do something at her network. And I went out there and I said, okay, now explain how you're connected. You go, okay, I got Cox, my cable modem's coming in here. It's plugged into this switch, and all my computers are plugged in. I'm like, okay, where's your router? No, that's all I got. I'm like, it's got to be a router. And she didn't know. Sure enough, she didn't have a router. It was literally a cable modem plugged into a switch. So I called Cox. I'm like, dudes, what's going on? There's no router. There's no security. Like, we sell our internet. We don't sell our security. <laughs> Which is true. They don't sell you security. So I told her, I said, Nancy, you really need a router in this network. And she said, no, no, I'm fine. It's been working fine forever. So I write down her IP address because every machine had a public IP address. Literally, it's kind of like she's standing out in the open waving her hands here, attack me. So I go to my house, 
and I remotely get into her machine. I call her back, and you know, I, I fix something for whatever it was. And they tell her, oh, it's going great. Thank you. You're so big of a help. I says, so how's this document going? And I read off the title. Yeah, I see you got this document open and all this other stuff going. You got this application running. She said, How are you seeing that? She said, I told you you have no security. You're totally wide open. She goes, What do you mind coming back? <laughs> so, uh, bucks. Yeah. And I tell you, when I when I first got my ISP, I first got my ISP, <clears throat> Cox said they would give me a free router. I mean, routers cost thousands of dollars sometimes for a decent one. Cox says, Oh, yeah, it comes with a free router. Oh, I'm Sweet. So they're out there to connect my network. I'm plugging everything in. I'm like, okay, can I have the username and password? Kind of like what I just asked you. And they're like, why do you want it? I'm like, so I can configure the ACL to secure it. Oh, our routers don't support that. So I'm like, what? Like, oh, yeah, this is just a router so you can connect it. I'm like, so there's no firewall. No. I'm like, okay. So I left it there, and I, like, I needed it to stay connected that day. Contacted a vendor online, literally overnighted me a new router. Two days later, Cox said, I said, here's your router back. Thank you, but no thank you, because there was no security on it. It's kind of like, you know, buying a house. Oh, don't bother locking the door. Don't even install the doors. Just leave them off. That's what they were doing. I don't know if that's what you have, but it could be. Well, it was about a 20-digit password. Okay, so it probably is some sort of browser. Yeah, really it probably is. Gateway, yeah. Okay. So they probably changed. I mean, initially though they didn't. So, but right now my Cox is home. I, I just they gave me a cable and this sucked. I had I had speed issues. So I call them to keep up in my speed. But it wouldn't work. I said, you know, your cable modem sucks. I went to Best Buy, bought me a Doxus three, new modem. I didn't want a router. I just wanted a modem because I had my own router. Very hard to buy just a modem, by the way. Because they want you to buy, the, oh, the router plus the wireless plus all this other stuff. I said, no, I just want the modem. So I found the modem. Night and day difference. I mean, literally night and day. It's so much better. But I'd look into what you all have at home. and I, bought, I put my own modem in yeah. with Cox, and I jumped from, I jumped probably 40. Yeah, I'd say I jumped at least that. I'm getting 150 megs up and then, or down. I'm getting like 85 up now. Yeah, I'm getting 100, about, I'm yeah. hovering between 140 and 150 yeah. down and yeah. like 75. Up. Yeah, about the same, I got that. And it's so much better because the crap they sell you is crap. I, I think, think that they're bad. AT&T's worse. Yeah, oh yeah, U-verse and all you that. Get, so. You get half or less of what they advertise with their equipment. Yeah. So I, I said no. And if you do get your own modem, by the way, you do have to call them because your IP is actually linked to the MAC address. That, that that number I showed you on the screen a minute ago. So what you do is you call them up and say, oh, I replaced the modem or the router. Yeah, whatever you replace. And they'll have you read that number. You're up and running in no time. So, yeah. So, right. so there could be issues. There could be security flaws. Buffer overflows. That's a whole other issue. Imagine me telling you to enter eight characters, but you enter 800 characters. Where does the other, that would be 700 where would the other bunch of them go? <laughs> okay. 792 characters. Where would they go? Well, they could just go somewhere in memory. Because, I mean, if you think about it, computers really just store everything in memory. So if you only have enough storage spot for eight, imagine being at your house and you have your whole counter lined up with containers. This one's for the crackers and this one's for the whatever. And you buy so many crackers that it literally overflows the, every container on your counter. What happened to everything in those containers? They're overwritten with crackers. That's what could happen with this. But for overflow, if it's not fixed correctly, you could overwrite everything. Okay. Uh, network operating systems allow server operators to exit to the command prompt. There's a lot of stuff you shouldn't do. That's one of them, but it really depends. I mean, I can't say don't ever allow them to. But the point is you can cause a lot of issues there. Okay, it really depends on who you are. They're trying to make it where you know, like only certain people can turn off machines now. Because really once you exit the <coughs> command prompt, you can add users, you can delete users, you can do all kinds of stuff from the command prompt nowadays. Okay. Administrative default security options. Did you change anything? Okay. When I first 
my very first ISP I ever worked with, uh, wasn't Keynet, I can't think of the name now, it was Linux based, and he hosted my website, and it, was, and it was funny, he left no defaults whatsoever. I don't know if you ever heard of Linux or even know what Linux is, it has a lot of like, um, var is where a lot of the log files end up, var logs. He renamed var to something else like tree or house. Everything was renamed. Every option was changed. So unless you knew what you were doing, you could find nothing. So if you broke into the system, you'd be like, uh, I don't know what to do. So it was actually very secure. Intercepting transactions between applications. We got a database application, database server. What happens if we capture the traffic between them? Way back when, oh man, when I first started learning about networks and early I guess early 90s. Wow. They, yeah, early 90s. I took a class, a networking class, by the way, and we were watching these robbers get caught stealing an ATM, the money out of an ATM, not the, the money out of it. What they did was, ATMs work on phone lines. Back then, we did not prevent replay attacks. What they did is they recorded the telephone conversation on the ATM when someone got money. Then just hit play, play, and they kept hitting play to get dumping money out. They just kept hitting play over and over, and the ATM just, I mean, that's way back when it was year, like early 90s, but that's crazy. So, yeah. Yeah, we just had stupid people drive up to my work and try and attach chains to it. Yeah, and I don't, yeah, some of those, yeah. someone just recently got away with one. I saw it in, oh, well, okay. Web browsers permit scripts to access system. Scripts will never access the actual file system. Scripts are needed to do things, but you need to limit on what they can do. Okay? Users must be careful about providing information to sites. Do you, okay, first of all, do you have to, okay, you know when you sign up for an account somewhere and ask you for a security question? You have to put in the right answer? No, don't. Don't, ever. Now this is when you're setting up the account. Obviously, you've already given the right information. You're going to have to give it to get back in. But say we're setting up a new account. I actually gave a presentation to the Middle City Chamber of Commerce. Turns out all the VPs and the executives of my bank were there. I didn't realize who they were. I was talking about how my bank does it. But I was talking about the security questions. I'm like, I said, so it asks for mother's maiden name, favorite color, favorite pet, all these weird questions we all answer. Put in something like chocolate milkshake. For all of them. So then all you have to remember is chocolate milkshake. And if I'm trying to break into your system and it's like mother's maiden name and I go search Facebook and I find your mother's maiden name, I'm never going to guess chocolate milkshake. I'm not going to. I, I give this presentation in that to a lot of kids at school. And a lot of, like I signed up for an account recently. It's like, who is your fifth grade teacher? The reason I came up with that is I don't have a clue who my fifth grade teacher was. I'm 54 years old. I moved every two years. I, I don't remember. So, but I tell kids, you know, we can figure out your fifth grade teacher because you're in fifth grade right now. But try to pick a question that's bogus or bizarre and put in the same like chocolate milkshake in all of them. Then all you got to remember is chocolate milkshake. Now, there's a couple sites like TRICARE. I know he probably uses that one. TRICARE won't let you put the same answer in all of them. So then it's chocolate milkshake one, chocolate milkshake two, chocolate milkshake three. So it's, uh, it's crazy. But all right. So users, okay, we talked about personal information. Improperly configured firewall. We, we're going to see more about that if I can get to that slide. Um, if not, maybe I'll talk to Jimmy about letting me come speak to you all next week to finish this up. Um, Telnet. Uh, or FTPs. I connected into FTP server a few minutes ago. It was unsecured. Oh, it's supposed to be. That's, a, that's an anonymous login. So it's not like I broke into anything. It was anonymous. But FTP and Telnet same, send username and password over clear text. It's not encrypted whatsoever. So if I was capturing traffic at this point, you could have gotten my bogus password I put in. So. Okay. All right, common internet, let's see, other issues, and probably configure firewalls, talked about that, we talked about telling it, why didn't they duplicate it? News groups, no one really uses those anymore, but they are out there, there's a lot of bad stuff out there, you got to be careful. Chat sessions, I mean, 
No one even uses chat. I mean, we use it like inside of Facebook and stuff, but there's all kinds of issues you can have. And denial of service happened to eBay, happened to Yahoo, it happened to half the internet this last weekend. Denial of service. And, you know, when I worked at an ISP, Key Tech Internet downtown, we had this mother and her son who were rich, way too much money for their own good. Back in the late 90s, maybe 2000 time period, bought a T1 from us. $1,800 a month. Very fast. It's 1.54 mega, megabits per second, but it's full digital, so it's very quick. So they bought a T1 from us. Well, they would sit there and go on IRC. They would go on chat channels. IRC is Internet Relay Chat, by the way. They would cause issues with people, get people pissed off at them. So what happened was a whole bunch of people attacked them one night. And since they were connected through us, they were attacking through us. So what do you think it did to our network? Killed our network. And you know, I know a lot of you got Cox here. People complain about Cox. But I'll tell you, if you have a business account, man, we call them up, 30 minutes, they're at your door. So we called them up, two were down, I mean, paid them 5000 a month. Okay, they're going to come out. So they came out, ended up blocking 16 entire Class C networks just to the point where our network could become usable again. They had to block it on their side because it was literally killed us. We had, our traffic was totally maxed out, and we were done. So that's a denial of services. We think of a call center. It was also funny when we, for that ISP, we bought out another ISP called Galstar Solutions out of Tulsa. They went bankrupt. The guy was pissed. So we bought it, and he didn't want us to have it, but he didn't have a choice. So we changed all the passwords. And he really screwed up the system, and it took us a week to fix it. But we drove it there, got all the stuff, brought it back here, and he had lots of clients. So they were down for that drive from Tulsa to here. But we connected it. It wasn't working right because he changed all the darn passwords on the encryption keys and everything. The phone started ringing. Because their phones obviously then rang to us, and all their clients started calling in with problems. I still remember that day sitting there, all the phones in the office, nonstop ringing, all of our cell phones. We were literally watching the voicemail kind of go up and up and up. That was denial of service. I couldn't do anything. I mean, I couldn't answer all the calls anyway. Even if I could, it's like, dude, I'm sorry. I can't fix it today because he changed frickin' encryption keys on the system, which sucked. He provided nationwide dial-up through WorldNet, that ATT, it, it, back when we had dial-up, okay? And he changed, basically we had a radius authentication server connected to ATT, and he changed the link between it so they no longer worked. So when you tried to log in, they no longer logged you in. So he was calling us, they were all calling us at that point, and we're like, Sucked. But okay, that was the denial of service. Okay. Distributed denial of service. Many people attacking you. So you could have one person attacking you, but now when you bring in a whole bunch of people, that's what... I mean, there's botnets out there you can buy. You can go on websites, go to Russia, and buy a botnet right now. You can, have, you can attack someone in 30 minutes. You can say, yep, I want this many... Zombies out there to attack this IP address, and here's the cache, and boom, they do it done. There's a, uh, another book out there called Spam Nation by Brian Krebs. He uh, runs Krebs Internet Security. I, I heard him talk at a conference. He talks all about how all that stuff works, and it's like crazy how these spammers work and how this, it, it's all related to the whole illegal drugs and not I'm talking pharmacies, you know, like the Canadian pharmacies and all the, here, buy some Viagra online, you know, that kind of stuff. But yeah, Brian Krebs, Spam Nation, really good book there. Okay, distributed reflector says the DOS attack bounces off an infected computer and gets other people. Just all kinds of issues. Permanent denial where it's never going to happen, <laughs> never going to come back. Physical attack on a device that attempts to alter the management system where it cannot be fixed again. That's the Iranian nuclear reactor. It really just screwed up the centrifuge, but really made it where it no longer worked. That's what we're talking about. 
unintentional. This is called a friendly attack because this is not done with malicious intent. Whoops, I put in your address by accident. That kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, to minimize break-ins is to communicate with and manage users via a thoroughly planned security policy. Okay, security policies, I hate policies. I hate them, I hate them, I hate them, but they're, oh my God, necessary. Okay. Password policies, the NSA's password policy, at least where I get in to manage grants, 12 to 14 characters long, two uppercase, two lowercase, two numbers, and two special characters. What kind of password is that? It's crazy. So you have to write it down. That's why I started using LastPass. Uh, passwords, you need to make, uh, make policies and follow them. Okay, policies are intended security goals, risks, authority levels. Hopefully at Rose State, ours would be coming from our president, okay? What we're going to do, who's involved in it. When I was in Tinker in the military, I was part of the red carpet team. Have you ever heard of the red carpet team? Where do you work at Tinker? Uh, AWACS. Anyway, well, I was in AWACS. Too. Well, I was in the network shop there at the end. I was part of this red carpet team. I'd never heard of the red carpet team, ever. But one day they called, they said, oh, by the way, Ken, you're on the red carpet team, and uh, we're doing a training today because we're going to have an activation. So the training base, what it was, red carpet team is if you've got somebody coming in that needs network very quickly. So as part of the team, I had a list of items I was to collect. It was a letter from the commander. It said, go to this specific office and take a monitor. <coughs> go to this office and take a computer. Go to this office and take a printer. We all had this list to get all this stuff. And we had to go to the church. We showed up at the church, we all brought our stuff, connected it all, and we had an entire working network. I mean, it's like, whoa. It was made so that, yeah, I took something from one office, but I didn't take enough to really hurt the office too much. It was made so you could get a network up and running without affecting, like, like can you imagine coming in here and taking this entire classroom full of computers? It would be like, great. But if we even went in and took one out of every classroom, we could still function. That's what that was. I, I, I was shocked it worked. And it's like, wow. So they probably still have it today. Well, policies, you know, who's on it? Who's responsible? The yeah, breach is what happens. Who do you call? So when I had Cox, I mean, you literally call them. I don't care. I mean, they'll even give you their personal cell phone numbers if you've got a, a business account. And they'll come out day, night, weekend, rain, snow, whatever. They are there, which is good. Because I always heard from people that had Cox Residential, eh, they don't ever answer. Never, I'm like, I never had that problem. Well, I do have res residential now because I got rid of my business. But luckily, after I got my own cable modem, I have had zero problems with Cox in like, man, five years now. Not one. So, things are not including the policy as hardware. Can you imagine a security policy saying you must be running an Optiplex 760? That's stupid, because that the Plex of 76, you can't even get any more. And if it died, we'd be kind of out of luck, okay? So you don't specify hardware, software, architecture, and even how to do it sometimes, okay? All right, work configuration, okay. Goals, it says, ensure authorized users have appropriate resource access. Availability, you know the whole CIA triangle, confidentiality, integrity, availability? You will need that forever, by the way. You will need it in all your classes. I even ask it in cryptography, and I'll be darned, someone got it wrong the other day. I'm like, seriously. You've heard it in every class up to this point, but availability, make sure they have access. I remember a couple years ago, the network in this building went down, just this building. And Steve needed to enroll people, our advisor. So I tethered my phone to my computer, and I was able to have access. So he'd come in there, okay, Ken, I need to borrow your computer. I need to enroll this student because I was the only one who had network access because I was the only one who had to tether a phone to a computer to make it work so they could get online. So, all right. Uh, so protect unauthorized um, user access, protect unauthorized data access. These are some of the things your policy should do, okay? Uh, communicate employees' responsibilities. What should you do as an employee? Well, you should change your password when told to. You should log off at the end of the day. All that kind of stuff. I used to work for Chapel Supply downtown. They sell pressure washers and cleaning equipment. And I had to 
worst time. I took care of the network, and their backups failed every night. Well, they had a big old accounting system. If you know anything about accounting systems, they're like database driven, but they open like 400 files to make them work. Well, if you don't close them out at the end of the night, what do they have it? You can't back them up, they're in use. So, and I could never understand, why don't they just close out the application? So I was going to figure out what the problem was. I went out there one day right at quitting time, and these guys were paid from 8 to 5. Not 501 and not 759. They didn't show up until exactly 8, and they went home at 5. I mean, that's it. I don't care. Middle of phone call, they would literally, they would, 5 o'clock come, they would literally lift up hands, roll chair back, and leave. In the middle of a phone call, in the middle of putting an order in, they would leave. They leave all the computers logged in. It was driving me bananas. I'm like, what the deal is? And one of the employees says, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth, because the place sucked to work for. They paid decent, but it wasn't the best environment. It was a sales business. They said, we can pay to five. We don't pay to 501. And I asked the owner about it. And he goes, well, I really can't. I can't have them quit work early because I need the sale. And I'm not going to pay them after five. So I said it, so it automatically logged them all off. I just didn't know what the problem was because no one would tell me. I, I would never fathom. Can you just imagine? Imagine being in the military. Oh, it's 4.30, lift your hands up and leave. You got some top secret files open or you got logged in. No, they just leave. So it was like crazy. So that's employee responsibilities. Okay? Have employees sign a consent form to monitoring. That same company, we did a lot of monitoring there too. But uh, okay. Okay, how do we do all this? We make a committee. We understand there is. What are some risks that could happen? Well, it's like a chair in the way here. You know, just what could be a risk to your environment? Okay. Um, we have stairs. You could trip down the stairs. My old office room, 131, we had uh, two, two chairs sitting by the doorway, one by each desk. Uh, Jerry Tittle, a faculty member, came in and tripped on the chair leg and fell down like this, popped her elbow right out, and broke her arm, and she was out for like six months. That's just a chair. So you never know what can happen. Okay. Conduct posture assessments. How are we doing? I mean, are we up to date on antivirus? I mean, are, do we looking good? Are we protecting ourselves is what we're doing. Right? So very, what, what do you think the odds are of getting a virus on campus? If you're working in IT services as an employer or whatever, what do you think the odds are? Whole pile of students aren't trained. That's one. Bunch of staff members aren't trained. Dr. Britton, our prior president, must have a virus. I'm getting Viagra emails from him every couple of days. And it's like, dude, I must be in his personal address book at home. I must be. Because I'm getting them all the time from Terry Britton, Viagra. I'm like, seriously, what? can you please clean your computer? But, uh, you know, what are the risks? People click on Dr. Hendricks. I mean, she gets viruses all the time. She's bringing it over here and we had to clean her computer. And, you know, okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, responsibility for addressing, you know, who takes care of what. Man, I had some good stuff to cover, too. Okay, um, define policy. You know, what these policies, I want to show you some examples. I'm going to show you. We only got four minutes. I'm going to show you some. I'm going to have to come back again because would it bother you if I came again? No? Okay. I probably add us a little bit more content than Jimmy does. Just, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah, I can't a see little it. bit. Yeah, that's why. Well. Okay, I can't show you what I want to show you because I forgot we're not on the same network in this room. Um, but I'll get with Jimmy. Do me a favor. Look over the rest of Chapter Eight, and I'll talk to him about coming in next week and you at least touch him. What? Our exam is next week. What? In our exam on Wednesday. Okay, I'll have him email you either. Maybe I'll come in the following week. Look over the rest of Chapter 8, because there's some really good stuff in here. And I even made some special stuff for y'all's slides. Let me show you. Oh, that's not the one I want. I even made... So that's on slide 17. Wow. I even added some actual NAT and ACLs from real live running systems 
so you can see what they actually are and everything. So, but uh, yeah, we're not quite there yet. We ran out of time. You all have class after this or something, don't you? Yeah. Okay. So, I'll see if we can't somehow pick up on 18. If not, maybe I'll record the rest of it and put a recording up there or something. Okay. I just, I don't know if you can tell it or not. I really like this topic. This topic awesome. So, okay. But let your, your instructor will let you know. All right.